Wisconsin Eye's 2014 election coverage is brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice for Wisconsin hospitals, supporting high quality, high value care in communities like yours. Wisconsin is at the Milwaukee Public Library interviewing candidates in the 2014 elections. We're interviewing State Representative Jim Ott of Mequon. He's a Republican seeking re-election in the 23rd Assembly District. Jim, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you, Steve. Good to be with you. Programming note, Wisconsin Eye appreciates the support of the Wisconsin Hospital Association, which represents more than 139 hospitals and health systems for making these candidate interviews possible. Jim, I want to start with a, a statement on your campaign website, and it kind of intrigues me. You say you're interested in exploring expanding user fees which could shift some costs of services to out-of-state residents. What are some examples of, of that? Well, I, I guess a, a basic user fee, Steve, would be uh, like boat launches in Wisconsin that, that used to be you know, funded and maintained by the municipality, whoever, wherever the boat launch was located, uh, and, and you could launch for free. Many of them now charge like three dollars, which is a you know a moderate fee. But the person that's using that parking lot and that launching facility is actually paying for it, rather than somebody who doesn't have a boat and doesn't fish. And, and so that's kind of the concept. And certainly, uh, looking at uh, at areas where we have a lot of out-of-state residents coming in, uh, are there things that they could be paying for based on their use of that facility as compared to, say, just the taxpayers funding it from whatever the general funds. That's a very interesting idea. Has anybody ever done a study of services provided by the state of state government or state or local government to out-of-state residents, to, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. And, and one, of, one of the problems with, uh, with user fees is that if they're done properly, the person using the facility or whatever it is, is is paying for it, and then the general taxpayers get relief from paying for that. If they're misused, uh, a user fee is implemented, but it's, there's no tax relief for the general taxpayer. There has to be a, you know, a equivalent tax relief so that the, the cost is shifted to the person who's using the, the benefit, but then the cost is relieved from the people who don't use it. And to the extent that you have out-of-state people coming in and, and maybe some of our facilities are being funded you know, mostly by Wisconsin residents, I think that's, that's what we'd have to look at. And obviously, that would take a little looking into, but it is a thought, I think, where, you know, and you see this in, in some states when you look at the, uh, the hotel tax, mm -hmm. if you stay there and you're from out of state, you know, the room tax, tax yeah. room tax, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting that, that that necessarily is where we go on this, but a general look at, at more user fees rather than having the general taxpayers fund somebody else's recreation. The concept of user fees most often comes up in the capital and transportation funding. As you're well aware, there's a projected deficit of 600 million, 700 right. million in the next two-year transportation budget. Thoughts on how to fill that? Well, certainly when you talk about user fees and transportation, the gas tax has been the main source of funding for, for transportation. Uh, the theory being that people who drive on the roads are the people who should pay for the roads. And then, of course, the shortfall developing uh, in part because we have more efficient cars on the roads. We're not using as much gas, and that's good. Uh, you know, obviously, you get 30 miles to gallon. It's more efficient than any 15 miles to gallon. But when you look at uh, a budget shortfall, and in, in any agency, there's there's two parts. There's the money that's spent, but there's also the money that's coming in. Um, and, and I think our Department of Transportation does uh, an excellent job in Wisconsin. And infrastructure, absolutely important to our economy and, and just to our you know state residents. If you want to get to Wisconsin, Dells, you want a good road to get there on. Um, I, I guess one thing I would say as far as that, that projected budget shortfall, um, is, is I think the Department of Transportation has to maybe look at prioritizing their spending and making sure that they're operating as efficiently as possible. You know, we had an issue that came up uh, last session where they were putting all of these uh, decorate, decorative uh, uh, additions to bridges, for example, uh, and that added to the cost. And the question is, if you're doing that rather than replacing another bridge someplace that needs to be replaced, are you really prioritizing things? I think roundabouts, we have to take a look at those. Uh, they are more land intensive, they are more expensive to build. Uh, do we want as many roundabouts as, as we're adding? A lot of people don't like roundabouts, so certainly I think there's a prioritizing there. Um, 
The other thing is I think we have to look at what the gas tax is used for right now. And some of the things that the gas tax are, are used for is not funding roads. So, so we should look at how we're using the gas tax. And in addition, uh, there's nothing that says if we really have an infrastructure problem, we need more money for the roads, there's nothing that says that we can't take some more money from the general fund and put it into transportation if the gas tax doesn't cover it. Uh, the thinking, of course, is, well, the people that use the roads are the ones who should pay for it, but we all benefit from good roads. Even if you don't own an automobile, the goods that are delivered to your supermarket, to your department store, they have to use the roads. They need good roads. So everybody benefits from, from good roads, and of course, it, it generally helps our economy in Wisconsin if our infrastructure is sound. Time to consider raising the gas tax. That hasn't been changed since 2006. The $75 you and I pay for our car, that hasn't been raised since 2008. Willing to consider those? I personally, Steve, would not consider that. Okay. Uh, when you say 2008, that's that's only six years ago that we, we raised a registration fee, and I think yeah. it went from 55 to 75. It was quite a substantial raise, like you know, that's 40 percent, 35, 40 percent. So no, I would not revisit raising those fees and and those sorts of uh, fees, like the registration fee. Uh, you know that has the biggest impact on the people who can least afford to pay it. Your campaign website talks about your frustration. You introduced eight drunken driving relating bills and you got one passed. Right. So it's still a priority for you. Does that include making first offense a crime, sir? Well, as you know, the, the bill I introduced would have made first offense a crime, criminal misdemeanor at blood alcohol concentrations of 0.15 and above, which is about twice the legal limit of 0.08, which is somebody who's pretty well impaired. Uh, we ran into problems with that, uh, not just because of the fiscal note that came along with it, but also because you've got uh, the same offense, driving OWI, um, and in one case, it's a crime. In another case, it would be a civil forfeiture. Now, we have, we have graded sentences uh, for, for something like theft, for example. You steal uh, over a certain amount, it's a higher level of crime than if you're, you're under a certain amount, but they're all crimes. Here, you'd have the same offense. In one case, it's a civil forfeiture. You're at 0.15, all of a criminal offense. So there are some issues there for the court system. Uh, the reason I made it 0.15, uh, I, I felt that maybe we'd have a better chance to get that through the legislature. Um, I guess there's some other ways we can deal with first offense that maybe wouldn't cause problems for the court system. For example, um, maybe we could say, okay, first offense is, is a criminal misdemeanor, but if you don't reoffend for five years, that criminal conviction is, is removed, it Falls reverts away. to a, a civil forfeiture. I if you see. do offend again within five years, then that remains a criminal and the second offense is a criminal. That's possibly another way to deal with it. Uh, the thing with first offense, uh, there's, a, there's a number of issues. Number one, um, there are cases where somebody has a first offense OWI and it, they really wake up and they never reoffend again. And you can see that in the statistics. There's more first offenses than second, mm -hmm. more, you know, more second than third, and so on. So some people do get the message. Uh, and it is possible that someone really does just make a mistake. And you know, if it's first offense is a crime, they get a criminal record for the rest of their lives. So that, that's the argument from the other side. But first offense, uh, number one, most first offenders are not at .085. They're considerably above that. In fact, in Wisconsin, 83% of all offenders are above .10. So we're not talking about people many times that just had one drink too many. The other thing is that st statistics show that, uh, and there, there may be no way to prove this, but people who are arrested for first time OWI may have driven drunk as many as 70 or 80 times before they're caught the first time. And finally, uh, there's a significant number of first offenders who are involved in crashes where someone is injured or killed. So I don't think we can minimize the seriousness of first offense, and I do think we have to look at, at dealing with that. Another, another bill that I introduced last time, Steve, and I'm definitely going to bring back uh, next time, is to have first offenders personally appear in court. Appear in court rather than right, send a lawyer. Or... Right. Right now they can send a lawyer, they can send in their fine. I think if a person stands in front of the judge, even if it's a civil forfeiture, I think maybe the message is, is more clearly put out there that, hey, you're heading down the wrong path, it's time to... You know, clean, clean things up. Okay. Um, when the, uh, assuming your reelection and the uh, budget for, for schools is up, 
Um, what's your position on the expansion of vouchers and choice? You know, the assembly speaker wants a 1,000 cap removed. Do you share that sentiment, sir? I do. Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to miss, visit many choice schools, particularly in the Milwaukee area, and, and I see that they're doing very good work. Uh, I, I certainly don't think that, that lifting the cap is, is going to have a, a really bad effect on our public schools. I, I went to public schools myself, graduate of Washington High School, and, and we have many public schools that are doing a fine job in Wisconsin. But, you know, some of the areas where the parents can least afford to send their students to a private school school and, and maybe their public school they're not happy with it this would give them an opportunity to do that and I think education is is so important from the ground level up you know if you look at poverty if you look at uh, a lot of things in our society looking at the ability to get a good job having a good education is where that all starts and to the extent that I think choice and charter schools are are helping to fill a void and are helping to improve the education of our young people absolutely I, I do favor lifting the cap What's your reaction to Governor Walker, Walker's call over the summer that uh, Wisconsin withdraw from the Common Core standards, Representative? I have, I have a problem with Common Core, Steve. Um, it's like, where did this thing come from? I have no problem with standards, by the way. I think we should have high educational standards. In fact, I would favor higher standards in Wisconsin than the Common Core standards. And there was a bill introduced in the legislature late in the last session that, that would have repealed Common Core in Wisconsin. The bill wasn't passed. I did sign on as a, as a co-sponsor okay. to the bill, though. Um, my, my basic issue with Common Core is, number one, it has not been vetted in Wisconsin, as far as I can see. You have teachers, you have parents who are saying, saying, well, nobody ever talked to us about this. And, and it's not the standards that's the problem. It's the fact that you're, you're going to have national standards. If you have national standards, you're going to have national testing. If you're going to have national testing, there's going to be some kind of a national curricula, which is going to be nationally produced textbooks, one size fits all. I don't know who's going to be producing these textbooks or what is going to be in them or how much oversight there's going to be in Wisconsin and how much choice teachers are going to have. Are they going to say, I don't like this Common Core textbook, I want a different one, but maybe that's not going to be geared to the testing that's going to be with it. So no, I, I definitely uh, have problems with Common Core and I, I do favor repealing it. And again, not to say no standards, I want standards, definitely want standards. And, and from what I understand, the Department of Public Instruction actually has developed standards. They just never brought them forward. Okay, let's talk about health care funding. One in five Wisconsin residents, as you know, get their health care from our Medicaid program. The American Hospital Association says our reimbursement rates are second lowest in the nation. If you have a position on the issue, should those reimbursement rates be increased? Well, if you just look at the re reimbursement rates as a standalone issue and you say we're second lowest in the nation, uh, you know, you say, wow, there's something wrong there. Maybe we should have a higher reimbursement rate. But I think you, ha you do have to look at that in the issue of the whole health care situation. And, you know, certainly we've done some things here in Wisconsin in, in recent sessions where now anyone who's below the federal poverty level qualify for Badger care. Um, and and um, we, we look at all of the things that are coming downstream in Obamacare and some of those keep getting changed as we go along so we're really not sure what's going to happen exactly when the exchanges go into effect. So I think that we have to look at that in relation to the whole picture and, and actually in Wisconsin up until um, uh, before this whole Obamacare uh, issue started to be discussed, I think 91% of our res residents did have health insurance. Now, it wasn't all Cadillac plans, but 91% did. Of the 9% that didn't, uh, one-third of those could have had health insurance and they chose not to take it. Another third would have qualified for one of our state programs and for some reason didn't take it. So that let 3% of our state residents that were really falling through the cracks. So I would look at, you know, instead of blowing up the whole system, I would look at how do you, you help these 3%. Uh, it's an important issue for city of Milwaukee, so I'm asking candidates who, who, who represents a region this question. Should there be state aid for any type of a new Milwaukee Bucks arena? That's an interesting question. Um, certainly just state aid, I guess there's different ways you can approach that. Uh, uh, certainly you can give incentives like we give to any business in Wisconsin, and that's not just pouring money into it. Uh, again, when you talk about, about users, you know, obviously you can say, well, the whole state benefits from professional sports teams, but certainly the 
area right around where the team plays, like in Milwaukee, would have the greatest benefit, whereas compared to somebody up in northern Wisconsin, should they be sending dollars down here to, to fund a new arena? Uh, I think that, you know, the Bradley Center, is, it's not that old, but I guess in terms of arenas today, it's like it's kind of ancient, past its, past its prime. So they so say. I, I would look at, uh, at ways to maybe you know, give incentives the same way as we would give to any other business, but simply sending tax dollars there to pay for part of it, I, I think that would be problematic for me. Your, uh, the, the bill to legalize medical marijuana is going to be coming back, and now we have the states of Colorado and Washington legalize recreational marijuana. Your position on those issues? I don't favor um, uh, legalizing marijuana recreational use at all. Uh, we did have a bill that passed the legislature last session that, that allowed for uh, one of the ingredients of marijuana that has medicinal values, the one of the oils that could be administered not by smoking and be administered by healthcare professionals, that, that does seem to have a, a positive impact on certain medical conditions. I think something like that is fine, but what some of the states are doing where they simply open up stores and people can go in and say, well, I've got a headache or something and I want some uh, marijuana, I don't favor that. I think that's just a backdoor way to get to recreational marijuana in use. And the whole idea of, of smoking pot. I mean, you're still smoking, for crying out loud. And, and so to say there's a medical benefit of smoking something when maybe there's not such a medical benefit of the smoking part, that in itself raises questions. But I think, the, I think what's happened in those states is they've had some real, real issues where it's just been a way to legalize marijuana and not, you know, it goes beyond medical medical uses. But I'm just if you said we're going to in, introduce a bill that would... Uh, would legalize medical marijuana like Colorado and, and whatever is done? No, I don't favor that at all. The latest Fiscal Bureau statement has raises the specter of a potential deficit of more than one billion. The Democrats, of course, you've heard them say that people like you over tax cut. Do you want to respond to that and the how to solve any potential deficit, Jim? Well, first of all, uh, over tax cutting is not something you hear about, a lot about in Wisconsin. We're still a relatively high tax state compared to, to the other states, Steve. Uh, and as, as far as that projected shortfall, you know, that's based on projections that start in uh, next summer, 2015. Mm -hmm. Our state is very solvent between now and, and June 30th of 2015. Our current budget has a surplus. We've got more money in the, in the uh, rainy day fund now than we've ever had. Uh, as far as what happens beyond 2015, you know, this, is, this would be like a, a situation where, where a family's expenses are just fine and it turns out they're gonna have a, a child uh, you know, nine months from now or six months from now and their expenses are going to be higher or they're going to have a child that uh, is going to be entering college and their expenses are going to be higher. Well, you wouldn't say that they're short of money right now. You would say they have a projected increase in expenses, but there's a lot of ways they could deal with that before that actually comes along. And I think the same thing here in Wisconsin, you know, obviously uh, if our economy keeps improving, we're going to have more revenue coming into the state. But that budget hasn't even been written yet. That's not going to be even introduced to the legislature until sometime in February next year. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about what's coming up starting next July. Uh, I'm worried more about the here and now. And, and the here and now, we're in pretty good shape in Wisconsin. And I, I think we're going to stay in good shape. And if, we, if that projected shortfall continues as we have new projections, we'll deal with it. And, and certainly increasing taxes is not the way to deal with it as far as I'm concerned. I still think there are more ways we can make our state run more efficiently so that the residents of the state have all the services they need, but we don't have a state government that's spending your money like it grows on trees. Then finally, do you want to highlight any differences with, between you and your opponent on November 4? I don't really know a lot about my opponent, uh, Steve. I haven't really heard much about uh, what, what issues are important to her. Um, you know, I've been in the legislature for eight years, so I have a track record. You could look at my voting record. I would assume if someone wants to run against me, they probably disagree with uh, most, if not all, of the votes I've taken. I voted for uh, the last two budgets. I voted in favor of all three tax cuts. I voted in favor of the mining bill. Um, you know, so I'm assuming that somebody who wants to run against me maybe you wouldn't agree with me on those things, and that's fine. That's why we have elections. Very good. Thank you. State Representative Jim Ott uh, is a Republican seeking re-election in the 23rd Assembly District. Jim, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Good to be with you, Steve. Thank you.